excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Anybody, anybody? All right, I got like 60% of you that are excited to be in the house of the Lord today, but I am so fired up, so pumped. I believe God does have a message of hope and encouragement and love that he wants to speak into your life today, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart. You are not here by accident. You are not here by accident. I don't care if you found us on Google. I don't care if you are watching online right now. I don't care what. Because I believe every time God wants to speak a word to his people, he arranges it. He arranges it. So you are here today because God wants to speak something special into your life. But before I go too far and before I start preaching, before even introducing myself, my name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this awesome church called Lifeline Church. We just love it here and we love Love, love, the, the honor it is to be able to pastor such a great group of people. And if this is one of your first times here, if you're a visitor just checking it out, come on, church, can you say hello to our guests and visitors today? Come on, do something. <laughs> yeah, we, we really are happy you're here. We really are. Okay, we are in part three, part three of a five-part series called A Little Bit of Wisdom. Because, li- you know, just... Just a little bit of wisdom can go a long way in our lives. Can I hear a better amen? Amen. Just a little bit of wisdom can do a lot. Now, now before I even go into that, um, I know that many of you are uh, praying with us and fasting with us for this 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, You know, I'm just, I don't know why they call it fasting because there ain't nothing fast about it. Come on, somebody. Feels me on that one. I'm like, but it's good. It's so good to, to quiet down that voice of the world in our lives, and to say, God, I'm I'm quieting the voice of the world because I want to hear your voice even clearer. You know, when we're fasting and we're praying, we're calling out to God and saying, God, please speak to me. And God says, okay. And he starts to whisper, God, what? What'd you say? I can't hear you. I can't hear you over social media. I can't hear you over TV. I can't hear you uh, uh, over going out, you know, every weekend. And I can't, I can't, what, God? I can't hear you. And God's like, I'm trying to speak to you, but the voices that you're allowing into your life are too loud. No wonder you can't hear me. That's what he's saying. So when we engage in this every single year, uh, we engage in prayer. Number one, it's prayer because fasting without prayer is just a diet. Come on, somebody. It's just a diet. And, you know, I don't, I don't need another diet in my life, and you don't need another diet in your life, but we want to hear the voice of God. That's what we really want. So I know that many of you are joining us in that, and it's just been a powerful time, just a powerful time. So a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of wisdom. This is a series from the book of Proverbs which was written by the the wisest man that the world has ever known, King Solomon, largely written by him. And it comes from this, this scripture right here really did it for me, really let me know that we needed to do this and do it first in the year. Check this out, Proverbs 4 says this, wisdom is, say it with me, it's, it's first, it's supreme, it's number one. And if it's on the top of God's priority list, man, it should be top on our priority list too, man. We need to get this wisdom. It says, wisdom is supreme, therefore go get it. Don't just sit around and wait for it. Go get it. Though it costs you everything you have, get understanding. Man, that is, that's a powerful thing. See, knowledge, knowledge is knowing some things. But wisdom is applying some things to your life that makes a life change in you. Does anybody understand that? Now, we can get a lot of knowledge, man. We all got, I got my phone over here, and I can, I can Google anything I want. I can get knowledge on anything. Listen to me here. It takes knowledge to build the Titanic. It takes wisdom to avoid the icebergs. Come on, somebody. Somebody wants to avoid some icebergs in your life. That's what wisdom is, is taking knowledge and applying it in a useful way so that your life is blessed and people around you's lives are blessed. It's just, it's the first thing we need to do. So this topic today this topic today, this, the title of my message is called The World of the Generous. The World of the Generous. This topic, you, you, can't, you can't run away from it. You can't get away from it. If you read your Bible for any length of time, you're going to come across it. It is going to smack you right in the face, and it's going to be right there. Generosity is a recurring theme. But how important is it really? That's what I want to I wanna just throw it out there. I mean, to be generous, I mean, it's, it's pretty important. It's kind of important at least. Let's talk about this. I, I did a little word study for, for y'all, and I want you to check this out. I did a little word study to see how many times these topics and words came up in the Bible. So words in the Bible, you would think a word like believe or belief 
would be in the Bible a lot. And it is. It's a big topic. It comes up 272 times, the word believe. And that's a lot of times. I mean, that's a big topic, right? Wow is right. But the next, you think prayer, praying. That's got to be like the, the, come on, let's come on with it. How many times does that come up? 371 times. Wow. That's a lot of times. How about love? You would think, man, that's the primary thing, right? Love. How many times? 714 times. Mic drop. Mic drop, man. That must be it. But how many times does the word and the theme of give and giving come up? 2,161 times. You would think that Jesus and the Bible was written for modern day America, but no. This is not something that only, oh, only our culture deals with. It. No, for all of history, for all of history. Why does God want to talk about generosity? Because our God is a generous God. God so loved the world that he, he gave. Giving is arguably one of the main topics in the Bible. This, this idea of, of generosity. And, he, and our God is an amazingly generous God. Very giving. He is very, and I believe that when you follow Christ, when you make that decision to follow Christ, say, yeah, I'm going to follow Christ. It's something that we inherit. When we make him our father, we inherit that. As children of God, we inherit that kind of generosity. Actually, I just want to give props to you as a church. You're one of the most generous churches for your size. You are one of the most generous churches that I know of. Because I know that you guys are getting this. So I just want to take, take that little moment and, and give you props because you're amazing for this. I, I'm, I'm blessed by it. I'm blessed. When I say that I'm, I have the privilege of being the pastor, it is a privilege because you guys totally get this, and it's amazing. I love it. But let me, let me talk to you about why, why, why we called this message what we called it. Um, Proverbs 11, out of the Message Bible, Message Bible, paraphrase, it says this. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Whoops. <laughs> How'd that get in there? <laughs> but the world of the generous gets larger and larger. And you want to know something interesting about all these passages, all these, all these times that, that that topic and this, this word comes up of giving and generosity? It is almost always in reference to the giver. You would think God wants to talk about giving because there's so many hurting people out there. Because there's so many people in need. Man, that comes up a little bit, but you want to know what comes up a lot? No, even this one right here, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. It's talking about what generosity does in us, not what generosity does for others. It's about what generosity does in us because it does something in us when we, decide, when we decide to engage in that. Basically, the Bible teaches that you should be generous not because of what it will do for them, but what it will do in you. In you. That's what, that's what this topic is all about. So let's get down to business today. I got a lot to cover and a little time to do it. So let's just go right to it. I've got bullet points in your handout. We also are on YouVersion, the Bible app. You can get on there and get on events and you can take some notes that way and follow along the scriptures. We've also got the scriptures on the screen. We try and make it as easy as possible for you to take that, take that step of engaging because what good is a message if you're not, if you don't get to participate in it. That's just the way I feel about it. So number one, the first thing I want to talk to you about is this. The generous are happy. The generous are happy. That's, that's cool, right? That's pretty fun. Don't believe me? Oh, let me talk about this for a second. It's like, it's like buying a candy bar from the little girl selling uh, or Girl Scout cookies. You know, she comes up to your door and you don't want any cookies because you're fasting. You don't want cookies. I'm like, oh my gosh, don't come at me with those cookies right now. I want them so bad, but I don't want them. But you know what you do instead? You take out a little dollar bill, and you're like, you know what, honey? I, I want you to do well, and, but I don't want your cookie right now. I want to just give you, and you see her face just light up. Have you ever done anything like that? Have you ever done anything like that where you just get, it could have been anything small, and you just gave it to them, and you saw their countenance change? It does something inside of you. Now, I'm, I'm here to tell you that, that God built in psychologically and, and physiologically, when we give, there's a response. There's a reaction. Your brain actually lets down chemicals. When you engage in generosity, it actually creates a good feeling in you. You know what that tells me? God could have said, you know what? You just need to give. You just need to do it. God didn't say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you do it. He said, I'm going to make you like it. That's awesome. I think God is so funny. He created our bodies to react the way they do, didn't he? So why, why would he do that? He wants, he, he wants you to see that this is, this is me. This is, I created you in my image. 
I created you to enjoy giving, to make you happy when you, because it makes me happy when I'm able to give my son, when I'm able to give the full, the riches and the fullness thereof, all the earth belongs to him. And he just, he distributes it out. The generous are happy. The generous are happy. Proverbs 11 says this, the generous will proper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Those who refresh others will refresh others. No, you'll be refreshed. That's what it says. That's what the whole point of the scripture said. When you refresh others, watch. Something's going to happen in you. Isn't that amazing? I just love God. Something happens inside of us. Proverbs 21. Some people are always greedy for more, but the, but the godly, they love to give. They're like just tossing stuff out, like prancing. They love to give. I'm not saying you got to prance to give, all right? Let me, back it up. You don't have to do, be it like that, okay? But let me explain to you a little bit what this is like. So I don't know if y'all are like me, but this happened to me recently. Christmas came. And uh, around the 23rd, I started buying presents for everybody. I'm just saying, you know. I, and I, no other procrastinators in the whole house. That's fine. It's just me. It's just me. But this is, let me tell you something what happens to me. And this happens just about every year. Every year. I start buying the week of Christmas. But, but this is what happens. I go into Walmart, and I got my shopping cart, and I'm, I'm, I'm boogieing through Walmart, and I'm like, get start, I get something, and I, I get some slippers for Tiffany, and I throw them in there, and I'm, and I'm, I'm going to the next, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, she's going to like these, and I start to imagine her wearing them. I start to imagine her enjoying them, and then I go, what else can I do? What else can I get her? And I overbuy in 48 hours. I've only been buying Christmas presents for 48 hours, but I overshoot my budget. Why? Because it's contagious. Giving triggers something inside of me, and even though I, I, I wait till the last second, well, somebody, I end up just going all out, on, and, I, and I, I start to put stuff in the cart even faster. In fact, does this happen to anybody else other than me? When you start to buy things for other people, something you're like, Oh my gosh, whoa. And then you, you had a plan, right? But then like the plan goes out the window because now I'm thinking, but, but this, this, this little shirt would go with those slippers and these pants would go with those slippers. Well, you can't have slippers without socks, so you need some socks. How about a little beanie? And I'm just getting all excited because the generous, the generous, lo they love to give. They love to give. It leaves us feeling happy, but, but the greedy, it's the opposite thing that happens. When we, when we, Reduce everything back, back to ourselves, and we're trying to hoard, and we're trying to, and we're only like putting things into our own shopping cart in Amazon, and we're like, I want this, but I want this. It, that's a spiral too. That gets us going down a path too, but it never leaves us feeling happy. It always leaves us. Tiffany talked about contentment last week, didn't she? It, it, uh, it never leaves us feeling like we ever have enough. See how, how the generous, they, they love to give. But, but here's the good news about all that is you, you can start yourself down either path you choose. You can start yourself down the path of generosity. You can start yourself down the path of, of you know, wanting to just keep those things for yourself. And I'm just letting you know it won't only please God. It won't only bless the other person. But it will bless you to start yourself down that path because the generous are happy. Number two, it goes like this. The generous are compassionate. The generous are compassionate. They're compassionate. In other words, the generous are, are in tune to the needs of others. It's like when, when you're really walking in this path of generosity, and this is the little bit of wisdom, man, is just to walk in that path of generosity. When you begin to do that, you will start, your antenna will start to go up, and you'll start to be in tune about the needs. Because there's one thing to buy gifts for people that don't need things, but when you start to really walk in, man, I'm in tune with some needs that are out there, and I'm ready to start giving to those. You're, you're in tune to those needs of other people. You're, you're aware of injustice and what can be done about it. And that's something that, that grows inside of us. Um, and of course, the greatest injustice that our world has ever known is that, is that people don't hear the name of Jesus Christ even once. Isn't that the greatest injustice that you can ever imagine? Someone not even having the opportunity to know Christ? That's the greatest injustice I can think of. And right here, it says in Proverbs 29, the righteous care. They just care. <laughs> you just care about injustice. Justice for the poor. But the wicked have no such concern. So did you know that when you give through Lifeline, and, and I said that on purpose, okay? You don't give to your local church. You give through your local church. 
Because your local church, I didn't know if you, you know this or not, because when you give through your local church, you are helping build a recovery center. You're helping hundreds of people uh, uh, hear the gospel each week. You're helping hundreds of people be fed every single week. These are things we do on a weekly basis. You're helping people get clothes on their back in this cold weather. When you give through your local church, you are actually distributing that generosity all throughout the whole community and throughout the world. So that's why I like to say you're not giving to a church. You're giving through a church because, you know, some people like to be strategic about giving. Some people don't want to just invest in one thing. They like to have a, a wide portfolio. They like to invest in, in overseas. They like to invest here. They like to invest in startups. They like to invest in long stand. No, they like to spread it around. And that's called wise investing. So when you're giving and thinking about generosity, why wouldn't we give to or through an organization that is reaching and touching every corner of the world. Let me explain to you um, how you're impacting not just this community, because Lifeline Church does an awesome job at reaching this community as far as the thrift store that we have down the street that feeds people every single week, that puts clothes on people's back every single week. When the Star Hotel burned down several months ago, we were able to give like 100 people full wardrobes again. You did that through your giving. Did you know that? Some, some of you might not even realize that. You just love to give, so you don't even realize what your giving is doing in the community. And I just want to bring you up to speed on a couple things. Let me bring you up to speed on a couple other things. So from your giving, did you know the leadership of this church has strategically, we sat down and strategically invested into different organizations so that we can reach as many people as possible. One thing we do to reach across the whole world is we invest in FMI, also known as Foursquare Missions International, which is responsible for sending missionaries and planting churches in over 150 nations. There's not very many left <laughs> that we haven't sent, missionary, sent missionaries and planted churches in. Today we have 66,000 churches that have been planted from your giving. Did you even know that your giving did that? Maybe you didn't even realize what, what your giving has been doing. So this represents 80% of the nations that even exist. And by the way, I can't even mention some of the missionaries that we have out that I personally am aware of, but I can't talk about because it's against the law for them to be having underground churches there. Your giving is helping that happen and helping people hear the name of Jesus where it's illegal for them to do so. Did you know? Did you know? Did you know, if that were not enough, that we sat down and we strategically give a percentage of everything that comes in, we give it to an organization known as the ARC, the Association of Related Churches, that to date has planted over 800 life-giving churches in this country and is, in my opinion, doing the best job of anyone. It's the fastest-growing organization about planting life-giving churches in this country. They just know how to get them in America. I don't know how. I don't know why. But we're using some of their stuff, too, and we're investing. in. The last year, they planted 80 churches. Most, most organizations are closing their doors. But through your giving, we opened 80 new life-giving churches. Let me just tell you, these churches don't start small. They start at about three, four hundred people reached in the community. That's how they begin, and then they grow past that. Did you know your giving was, was helping that happen? It is, and it's making a difference in the kingdom of God. If that were not enough, did you know that from your giving, we are actually strategically investing to reaching people in Israel? That we're actually giving to Christian organizations that are helping Jews, the inherent ones from God, God's first children, and what does the Bible say about that? If you bless my people, I will bless you. Did you know that you're, you are giving to Israel? From your, your giving, not to here, your giving through here is doing all of those things. So think about that the next time God puts it in your mind or gives you the idea or gives you the unction to want to give through your local church. Maybe you're visiting today. Maybe this isn't even your local church. But maybe you're, where you're called to do, next time God puts it in your mind to do that, Think about all those things next time God puts that on your heart. Proverbs 21 says this, if a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. Dang, Lord, <laughs> that's rough, isn't it? Well, um, don't tune this out, everybody. I, I know it can be hard to hear about this kind of stuff. Some, it can be hard for all of us to kind of hear about this, but I'm just... I'm just trying to help you see. I'm trying to help you see the value in this. If, if just doing it because it was the right thing to do were enough, that'd be one thing. But I want you to be educated and know, like, this is how my giving is changing lives, okay? And you won't be tuned out when you're the one in need, too. <laughs> how about this next one? This one, next one's a little bit funner. The generous are blessed. 
The generous are blessed. Come on, somebody. Are you ready for a little reprieve here? The generous are blessed, and I love that. Now, it's my job as a pastor, though, to teach this in balance. Teach this in balance, because the last thing I want is for all of y'all to, you know, engage in giving and, you know, engage in being generous, whether it's here or anywhere, and be like, yep, can't wait for my blessing, you know, because what, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to, like, really, really convince you about the principle of getting? No. I want you to catch the revelation of, of giving. But this is, it's very clear what the Bible says about the issue. It says you will be blessed. But I don't want that to be your motivation. And we, we have something that we say around here, and it really matters to us. We don't give to get. We give to give. We give because it's a part of who we are. It's, it's who our Father is, and that's what we do. And so we, we always grow in that, and we may not be perfect in it, but we, we take steps in that direction because we just know that's the heart of our Father. But with that in mind, listen to this verse in Proverbs 22. Blessed are those who are generous because they feed the poor. And literally, your giving through here does that. But before we depart this point, you know, I, I kind of want to move on from you just being blessed because it's not the thing I want to leave in your mouth when you, when you leave here. I want, you to, I want you to know why. Why does God want to bless people who are generous? Is it so that they can just have more? No, not at all. Before we depart this point, I have to give you the reason, and it comes from Genesis 12. God, this, is, this is God speaking to Abraham. The, the father of many nations, the one who would begin the Jewish nation. Listen to what he said to him. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing to others. We are blessed to bless others. And let me tell you something. If you live in the great country, the United States of America, you are blessed Period. I don't care if you were even homeless, you're richer than most people across the world. It's, it's just the truth of the matter. But I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So let me put it this way. We as individuals, we give through our local church to strategically impact the world. In the same way, in the same way, God gives through individuals who are generous to strategically impact the world. It's the same model. It's the same. We give through to spread it around. It's like it's like this seed scatter right here. Some of you are wondering what the heck I was thinking about doing with this seed scatter right here. This right, if you've never heard of one, this scatter seed, all right, it's uh, for your lawn. If your lawn is looking anything like mine, it may be a little bit brown right now. Oh, is it going to fall? That's all right. That's the point. I'm going to get to that. It's going to be great. So when this is what happens, uh, we get a little bit of, we get a little bit of resource from God. And who's the source? God's the source. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he goes, all right, son, all right, daughter, here's some resource. I've got no shortage of supply, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to, I want you to scatter it around. Oh, i got to pull the trigger. Woo! Front row is the splash zone, let me tell you that. And I want you to spread it around. It's all right. we got vacuum cleaners, y'all. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. He said, I'm, I'm going to give resource to you, but I want you to spread it around. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Are you running low? Hold on, son. I got more. I got more. But let me tell you something else. Let's say our spreader around her is busted and I don't pull the trigger. If I'm God, why am I going to put more resource there if it's not going to do what I want it to do? I, I had created this so that we could spread this wealth around. God has always used people. To do all the great, why do you think every book in your Bible was written by a human being? Because God uses human being. He uses human beings to get his job done. And if we're not pulling that generosity trigger and that, that spreader ain't working around, that flow is going to stop. That flow is going to stop. Or you're just going to reach your lid. You're going to reach your lid. But let's say, on the other hand, man, you getting, you, you've heard this message. You get funky about it. You're like, yeah. I'm really excited about this. This is so much fun. And you're running out. And God is going, he's dumping and he's dumping and he's dumping. Man, I can't keep this guy full. What am I supposed to do about that? I think it's time to do step number four. The generous are rewarded. Because if I'm God, and maybe I'm just simple, but if I'm God and I can't keep I can't keep you full enough because you are just spreading that thing around just as crazy as you possibly can, I need to increase your capacity. And I need to, because this right here, this is available for every single person who can get this concept. 
I'm not saying you, you give to get and you give to be blessed. You're going to build a bigger house or some kind of thing like that. The whole purpose, and if you think that, you miss the whole point of this illustration that it's to spread it around. It's to, it's to strategically invest in people who are hurting and in need because those who bless the poor are themselves blessed. This is the last. Oh. I'm spreading that seed around. Come on, somebody. The generous are rewarded. When you begin to flow strongly in your generosity, God will increase your capacity. If you don't believe me, let me just prove it to you from the Bible. Proverbs 19, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord. I don't see why God would, would feel the need to pay me back for anything. He already gave enough when he gave his son to die for me on the cross, and I was living in my sin, but still sent someone to minister to me, and now I'm a saved person. I'm a son of the most high God. I don't see why he thinks he needs to pay me back for anything. But it says right here, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord, and he will repay you. Put that scripture up if you would for me, please. Do you got that one? He will, he doesn't need to repay me for anything. I don't know about you, but this is his party, and he does it the way he feels like doing it. And if he said he's going to repay you, that's exactly what he intends to do. And who am I to question him about that? I got one more. Revelation 22, verse 12. Look, I am coming. This was on the last page of your Bible. This is one of the last things Jesus said to us before he finally left John, the island of Patmos. He was out there, and he was hearing the last revelation from God. This is on the last page of your written Bible. Look, I'm coming soon, bringing my reward. He said, I can't even wait. I can't even wait for you to get. I'm bringing it with me when I come. This is powerful for me. I, this has always been a really passionate topic for me. This is something that changed my life early on. He said, I'm bringing my reward with me to repay all the people according to their deeds. And I don't know about you, but that last verse has a tendency to scare me a little bit because he says he's coming and I, I'm, I know which, what everything that has been going on. I am going to repay you for your deeds. It's not in a scary way. I'm not like scared. Oh my God, he's watching me. It's scary. But we did talk about in the first week that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if we don't start with a fear of God, a healthy fear of God, then we really have no legs to stand on. So this, this verse does put a little fear of God in me that one day he's going to come, he's going to look me square in the face and say, how'd you do? <laughs> I did my best. God, I, I tried my hardest. I gave my, I want to say I gave my all. I want to say I gave everything. I want to say I lived like this with my hands wide open. I didn't clutch on to anything because I know this world is fleeting. I want to be able to say that. But none of us, none of us are perfect. I'm not, I'm not asking you to be so. He, he's going he's gonna to look right here. He's going to look in your heart. Say, how'd you do? Did you, did you shut your ears to what I was saying? Or did you, or did you give it your best? Because this, this verse scares me because I just am reminded how blessed we are as, Amer as Americans. Like, I don't know where you're watching from. We've had people watching from Germany. We've had people watching from, from just crazy places. I don't know why you're watching. I hope you're enjoying it. But in America, we're straight up blessed. Straight, straight up. I can't, you can't get around it. You're blessed no matter what. It, it scares me because I have to realize that I am so stinking blessed, and I'm going to be held accountable for that. I'm going to be held accountable for, I have been given so much resource. I live in one of the greatest countries the world has ever known, and I'm going to, how did you use it? What did you do with that? Let me just talk. We have multiple cars. <laughs> we have special houses for those cars called garages, okay? It's crazy. We go places where they bring us hot, delicious food. We forget to say thank you, and we send it back if it doesn't meet our highest standards, okay? It goes on. We open our closet to walk in there to see hundreds of possible outfit combinations, and we storm out saying, I got nothing to wear. We're so stinking blessed. And we complain. And we stress, like, if I give a little away, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm going to make it. It's crazy. All that to say we're extremely blessed, but can we honestly say we're equally generous with how blessed we are? That's, that's the real question. Like, we all ha have different contexts. We, we all have slightly different, you know, places that we're at.
But when I'm standing before the Lord on that day, I, I want to be able to say that I managed and distributed that blessing the best I could. When I meet him face to face, I, I want to do like, like this quote. Winston Churchill was quoted as saying this, and I really love this. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And that's, and that is, that's very true. We make a living by what we get. Like I can make a living. I know how to, I could go anywhere, do anything. I can make a living. But what I give to others, that, that builds what we want to call a legacy life. That, lives a, that leaves a legacy behind us. That, that means I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about what my life does for the people around me because I have that heart of generosity in me. If I'm living a legacy life. Actually, the person who wrote this series, I didn't, I didn't create this series. Tiffany and I, we, we made it work for us. We used our own stories. We put our own scriptures in. But, like, they gave us the cool little video up front, you know. That guy fulfilled his own quote when he said this. Chris Hodges said this, what we do for ourselves dies with us, but what we do for others lives beyond us. And he created this whole thing, and he gave it to us, and he like, he did exactly what he said. What I do for others is now, he's from Alabama, some church in Alabama is actually blessing a church in California right now, because what we do for others lives beyond us. But what we do for ourselves dies with us. That is, that's crazy. So what does it mean to leave a legacy life? It goes like this, Psalm 112. They share freely, people who live a legacy life. They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered. Say it. How long? How long will, they, will their deeds be remembered? For their lifetime? For their kids' lifetime? For their grandkids? Say it again. Forever, they'll be remembered forever because that's what a legacy does. It lives forever. When people learn to give and people learn this principle of generosity, they make an eternal difference. An eternal difference. Man, that's, that's so strong. They have influence and honor, not just in our lifetime, but forever. Psalm 112 also goes on to say this, good will come to those good will come to him who is generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. Surely he will never be shaken. Never. Never. There's, there's a lot of absolutes. Have you ever been taught not to use absolutes? God's not scared of it. I use absolutes all that he loves it. They'll never be shaken. They will never be shaken. A righteous man will be remembered for a little while. No, forever. We need to get outside of the immediate stresses, the immediate anxieties, the immediate, like, sm the smallness of thinking we don't have the ability to be gentle. We do. We absolutely do. And here's my goal today. I want to stir you towards that. I want to stir you towards that kind of generosity. I want to give you some practical things that you can do even today. Because this message is, if you haven't caught it yet, it's way more than money, right? This is a big topic that has way more to do than just with your pocketbook, but it does include that. It does include that. I want to stir you towards that. And listen to me, everyone. You, you can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have, and God doesn't expect you to. He doesn't. God has never asked you to give based on what the person next to you is giving. He never did. Let me go ahead and talk to you about this. This is um, not in your notes, but I wanted to add it, and I wanted to include it for you today. It comes from Mark 12. It's actually, you might know this if you grew up in church at all, as the widow's might, you know, when Jesus is there. Let me just read it to you. I'll just give it to you right now. Mark 12, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were being put in, and he watched. <laughs> he watched. He was watching that happen. He watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. It's not very nice of you, Jesus, to be watching me. <laughs> Many rich people threw in large amounts. They threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. She, she went up there in front of ding, 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 like three pennies, a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, he said, not only am I watching, I'm calling my, other, my church leaders to come watch this too. I want you to see this. He called his disciples to him and said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth. They gave a sliver of their wealth. A sliver. And they're feeling good about it too. They're like, oh yeah, look at this. Everybody got like, can I get a uh, hundred dollars in dimes? And they put it in the basket. And it's like, oh man. And they're like, yeah, that's right, right here, everybody. Right here, you know. Passing the basket over here. You know, boom, putting it in there. Out of their wealth. They gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, out of her poverty, put in everything she had to live on. Number one, from that, from this, God watches 
what is given. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he was sitting watching then, I got some news for you. He still sees. In fact, only in modern times do people really care about privacy with their giving. And I wonder why. Giving the, to the local church, historically speaking, was always a public event. The big, uh, they had a big offering container, like right in the middle of the courtyard. And people would come in, and it was a public event. Everybody knew what was going on, and that was the way it was done. But now it's like, you know, don't let your left hand see what the right hand is doing. Everybody want really concerned about not being watched now. But let me just tell you, even if nobody else sees it, God does. You can fool me. You can fool Tiffany. You can fool everyone here about what's going on with that. But Jesus is watching. Jesus knows. Number two, he's not concerned. He's not as concerned with amounts as he is with percentages. Because God, not only, Jesus, not only knew what was being given, he knew what that represented to them. That's why I can say, it's because of this scripture, God isn't as concerned with amounts as he is with percentages because he looks at the heart and knew that that widow, that was all she had. That was all she had. And so as far as God was concerned, that was the bigger gift. And he was sitting there looking at those big offerings being put in, 10,000, 100,000. <sighs> His streets are made with gold. He doesn't care about that. He's looking at their hearts. And he looked at a widow's heart and said, man, that could have bought you a little crumb of bread right there. I'll bet you're hungry. Don't worry. I'll take care of you. God is more concerned with percentages than he is with amounts. That's why the Bible has always talked about the tithe. It means 10%. That means every single person here is, is responsible for a different amount. You, me, and by the way, I'm not exempt from that. My wife and I have been doing that since before we got married and after we started here. We always have done that, but every single person here, and God doesn't lose count. He's not like having trouble carrying the three, and he, he knows, and you do too. And all of us, are, we're responsible for different amounts, and God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at a big, the big pot and say, you know what, well, you didn't give exactly as much as they did. He not, cause, I'll talk to them later, and I will. I'm talking to you right now. What did you do with what I gave you? But biblically, um, you know, the, the tithe, I'm not even really talking about that because that's just the beginning. Like, that's the obligatory part. I'll talk about that in a second right before we wrap up. But 2 Corinthians 9 says this. He said, you will be made rich in every way, not just money, not just money. You'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. From this verse, we ought to be thinking, Lord, what are all the things that you've given me that I can be generous with? I'm trying to think right now, like, if it's not just money, and it would be simpler if it was, because I could just write a check and be done with it, but it's not like that. It's not at all like that. No, he said, I'm going to bless you on, in every way. I'm going to bless you with time. I'm going to bless you with talent. I'm going to bless you with touch, and I'm going to bless you with treasure, and I'm going to be checking. How, how are you dealing with all of those things, which gets me to uh, my next thing. This is about to get practical. For those of you who are looking forward to some practical things you can do, it's going to start right now. Thing number one you can do, go ahead and put this up on the screen for me. You could be generous with our time. If you want to be a legacy person, you want to live a legacy life, you could be generous with your time. And for some of you, your time is more valuable than your money. Man, you know, you'd be like the, the poor widow who gave only a few cents. The money's not worth that much, but she can give her time at the temple. Listen, I want to talk about a group of people right now. I'm talking about the group of people that are watching your kids right now, praying over them. I'm talking about the people that made sure there was toilet paper in the stalls today. I'm talking about the people that were standing outside smiling at you, shaking your hand when you walked in. I'm talking about the people that are click clacking on all the computers back there, making everything go nice and smooth just the way we like it. I'm talking about the people holding cameras right now. I'm talking about the people who, who printed those bulletins that you're holding in your hand. Oh, this is kind of nice, but somebody gave their time. I'm talking about the dream team. I'm talking about the people that said, you know what, I'm not only going to worship here, I'm going to give my time here, and I'm going to be generous with that time. We were talking about this this morning in our morning rally, uh, and God wants to bless you for that too, for being generous with your time. Because for some of you, and that's, that's one of the big things that you can do is begin to, begin to be generous with your time and how you're giving your time to people. Number two, you can be generous with your talent. You can be generous with your talent. Some of you might be thinking, you know, Pastor, I'm not that talented. <laughs> and uh, yes, you are. You are absolutely talented. 
You have talent. Maybe you're not American Idol talent, because some of you, you know, you just ain't. <laughs> you ain't American Idol talent, so don't, you know, like, you try for a different team, all right? But you got talents. You got t- Ephesians 4 talks about to each one, grace has been given. And that word grace is, transla- is translated from a Greek word charis or charisma. That means divine enablement. Divine enablement. Each one, to each one, a divine enablement has been given to do certain things well. Every single person in this room listening online everywhere was created with talents and spiritual gifts and abilities to be able to make an impact in the life of another person. Maybe it's a loud gift like mine, like I had a loud gift and everybody on the worship team, we got loud. It's easy to see what ours are, but you know, I've had people be generous with their time, you know, like this haircut right here. Someone someone had the talent of cutting hair and said, you know what, I'll just cut your hair for free. That's called being generous with your talent. But if you don't know what your talent is, it could have to do with anything. It could have to do with music. It could have to do with um, organizing things well. It could have to do with um, encouraging and teaching people. That's why we have a growth track here. Every Sunday during our second service, we have a growth track. And a part of that process is learning what your spiritual gift is and what your personality you know, profile is. Why? Because we want to teach you about what your charis is what your divine enablement is so that you can serve with and be generous with your talents. You can be generous with your talent. Number three, you can be generous with your touch. You can be generous with your touch. Let me explain to you a little bit of what this means. This is kind of a new one. I always talk about time, talent, and treasure, but touch is a little new. So let me explain. Did you know that you could pick up your phone right now? Matter of fact, go ahead. Pick it up. Take your phone out. It's all good. Take it out. Go ahead, everybody now. Take it out. You could pull out your phone right now. And I can pray a little prayer like this. Lord, give every single person here a name of a friend or a family member that could use a little sentence that says, hey, love you, thinking about you, praying for you. Can we take like 15 seconds for you to do that? I'll wait. I don't care about awkward silences. Go ahead. If I had my phone, I'd be doing it. That's called being generous with your touch. That's called, how much did that, that didn't cost you a dime. That cost you nothing. But you were generous with giving someone a touch and just touching them on the, I'm I'm praying for you. I care for you. You matter to me. And you have no idea what that might do in the life of another person. You have no idea what they're going through right now. Maybe God gave you a name of a person that you haven't talked to in a minute. And you have no idea what they're going through, what their context is, but they they might just come back and say, with as many people as we have here, there might be one person at least that comes back and said, you, know how, you don't even know how much I needed that right now. You have no idea what my, what's going on in my mind right now. And you just saying that changed everything for me. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. There's a principle here that it's sowing and reaping. The seeds are appropriate. When we sow generosity, we reap Generosity, if you don't know what sowing is, it means scattering seed. It means planting seeds in the ground. And reaping means I get to pick the apples that I I planted. Or I get to pick the generosity that I planted. Or I get to pick the blessing that I gave to others. You can be generous with your touch. You have no idea when God wants to distribute a touch of encouragement through you. Because God wants to use people. He wants to use people to bless others. And this last one should be obvious. We can be generous with our treasure. We can be generous with our treasure. Now, there's something I need to clarify here because you might be thinking, I'm just talking about tithing. You know, it's like the the baseline thing, you know. But Malachi 3.10 does say that the tithe belongs to God. So obviously, I'm not talking about tithing at all. Why? Because this this thing belongs to Ernie Meyer. And and, and if I was saying to myself, hey, hey, Ernie, where's he at? I'm feeling generous right now. I'm going to give this to you. What's he going to say? You dang right you're going to give it to me. That's mine. Because if I keep it, there's a word for that. And that's exactly what the scripture goes on to say. That when we keep that, it, you, you're not even being generous with that. You're just being obedient. So I'm not even talking about that. Man, if you think, if you think this kind of preaching is strong, you know, and I cross the line, let me go ahead and long jump over that line right now. I'm talking about tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings, because when we begin to, like, move beyond the baseline foundational stuff, that's when we really begin to see breakthrough in our life. We really begin to see it. 
you know, I can't give him back what belongs to him is, is obligatory. So I'm talking about another level, the, t- the term tithes and offerings. And, I, and I'll just go ahead and the best way for me to talk about this is just to be vulnerable with you. And I, I did wrestle with this quite a bit because I don't want to come off like I'm some kind of, you know, perfect or anything. But Tiffany and I have been tithing since before we got married, since before we became pastors. It wasn't something we did so that, you know, for me, I just read it in the Bible and was like, oh, supposed to do that? Okay. I guess it was helpful that I didn't make a whole lot of money then. And so it was easy for me to take that step. Maybe. You know, and if that's the case for you, I pray that God would bring you to a place where you can make that step so that you can begin to move forward. And so we made that step, but this is something that, this is something else that happened. Um, Tiffany's parents, and she told me about this, that they would always meet, um, this was years ago when she was a kid, and she picked this up when she was a kid watching her parents. And so what we do actually matters not just for us, but our kids watch us do the same thing too. And what Tiffany would watch her parents do is every year or so, they would evaluate their giving and decide how much more percentage they could give. So it wasn't like the amount they were looking at. They were looking at the percentage. So no matter what raise they got, no matter what job they lost, they would always look at the percentage and see how much more percentage they can do. And so Tiffany brought that up to me, and I'm like, what do I got to lose? What do I care? You know, I was a sinner. I don't know about y'all, but I was out there on the streets using drugs. I was out there in jail spending, doing, doing time. And now I'm out here like, I'm going to try and keep some stuff that God gave me. I don't care. What, what are you going to take from me that I haven't already lost <laughs> and gotten back like 10 times? I don't care. And so I just was like, let's do this. And every year, so often, every couple years, every year, we've been able to go from 10 to 11 to, to I, you know, but it's just, it keeps, it keeps on going. And let me tell you a story or two. You know that, that, that thing about that person cutting my hair? Every time we go up, some bill, some recurring bill goes away. Some, one of the first times we did it, someone came to me and said, hey, I heard you like to play golf. I'm like, yeah, I do. Like, if, I, if I took care of it, would you play more? Would you be able to relax more? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I would. I'm going to do that. Right, right, after we went, what, right after we went up and said, you know what, God, we're going we're gonna to give even more. And, and God's like, and just recently, we did it again. We did it again. And it, you know, I got cool hair, you know, so I, I need a cool haircut, right? I need, like, I won't pay money for my haircut. So I was, okay, you laugh at me. You laugh at me. But I spent, like, $40 a month getting a haircut. I would give every three. I was, like, allocated that much, but I only ended up spending, like, 30 Because it's, like, 15 and then I got to tip this dude. He knows I'm a pastor. I'm not going to not tip him. I'm going to tip the heck out of him. So I'm going to tip him, and then I'm going to come in every three weeks or so so I look fresh. And yeah, it's just, you know, you got things that you do. So I got things that I do too, okay? Come on. So we went up in our giving, and somebody came to me, a hairstylist, someone who's really good, and said, you know what? Man, you would look cooler if you got your hair cut every week. You're, you got a public platform, man. You need to look good. Let's take care of that. $40. Just It's happened again and again and again. I'm trying to tell you. I'm, I'm trying to show you that God's not going to leave you behind in this. I'm not saying that if you start giving or if you give more, he's going to, you know, give you a house. I, this is not at all what I'm talking. I'm just saying that God is real, and he does real things in our lives. He actually shows up, and he actually does what he said he would do in his word. I'm trying to show you that this is not just, it's real. It's re- and this principle is true. And this scripture that I'm about to talk to you about right now in Luke 6, it says give, and it will be given to you. Press down, good measure, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. And that's not even talking about money. You know what this is talking about? It's talking about judgment. You know what that, you know what that shows me? This is true in every single area of your life. This is a principle that is unavoidable. It says judge not. Right before this, I don't know if you knew that, but right before this it says judge not and you will not be judged. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Give and it will be given to you. Give judgment and judgment will be given to you. Give forgiveness and forgiveness will be given to you. Give finances and your finances will be taken care of. Give mercy and compassion, 
and mercy and compassion will be given to you. Press down, shaken together, more than you deserve. You plant one seed, do you get one apple in return? And that's not the way God set it up either. It will be measured to you. And if that's true, which I believe it is, I've seen it in my own life. If that's true, I want to figure out as many ways of being generous as I possibly can. As many ways. And the best way for me to close out this message is to sum it up like this. This is the little bit of wisdom that I want you to take home with you right now. All right, check this out. Write it down. Take a picture of it on the screen. Do whatever you have to do. The value of life is not determined by how much I achieve or accumulate, but on how much of my life I give away. That's how my life is measured. Now, I, I know that, that a lot of people struggle with, with this issue, but I, I, I'm, I'm believing that you're not here by accident, that wherever you go home to, wherever you go back to, whatever context you're in, that God is not, he's not trying to be mean about this. He's not trying to be judgmental about this, but he really, he does want to speak something that, that could possibly just change your life forever and your kids' lives. It did with Tiffany's parents. It didn't just change her. It changed me too. And I thank God for that. And, I, and I, that's my prayer for you. It's because when I, when I was down and out, someone gave their time. When I, was, when I was doing time in jail and then came to a Salvation Army, someone donated their, their time. Someone donated their treasure. Someone donated their touch so that I would know the Lord. And so that I'd be able to stand in front of you now. Generosity is a big topic. And it saved my life. And I want, and I want it to help you too. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. We're going to close in prayer today. And this is something that we do every single week is I, is I, want, you to take, I want you to take a moment and just allow, allow God, allow the Holy Spirit to begin to speak to you about what this message means in your life right now. Just go ahead and ask him, Lord, what's the application for me? You can ask him just in the quiet of your own heart. You can even ask him under your breath, whatever helps you do it. Lord, what are you trying to speak to me? And I just know with, it, with all of our heads down and eyes closed, I just know there are some people here today who, who, have a, who have a strained relationship with God. And maybe, maybe you feel just so distant from him right now and somehow, some way, God has been speaking to you even while I've been talking. I've been talking, but God is the one who's been speaking. And I just want to give an opportunity for every single person here whether you had a relationship with God, whether you never had a relationship with him, no matter where you stand with God, there is an opportunity and an offer right now for you to come back into close fellowship with him. And it's as simple as just taking one step towards God. Because let me tell you something that might change, that might change your perspective. God is not as concerned how far away you are from him. He's concerned on what direction you are moving. Are we gonna make a step towards him? Are we going to lift our hands in just a moment and say, yes, Lord, I want more of you. I want to be close to you. I have been distant. I have, I have grown distant from you, God, and I'm ready to step back in. Or maybe you haven't even had a relationship with him. You're ready to say, I'm, I'm going to start this thing off today. I'm going to start this thing off today. So if that's you and you want to do something new in your life, you want to give your life to Jesus and let him take the controls of your life and begin to have a new start in your life because behold God makes all things new he makes broken things fixed and God doesn't make junk you are not junk you are not leftovers you are not a waste God you are God's treasure you're his masterpiece he loves you more than I could ever explain or describe he loves you loves you loves you and cares about every single feeling that you're feeling right now every single struggle you're having God cares about it more than I ever could than your mom or dad ever could, than any of your closest friends ever could. God is the one. He's the only one who can make that need. He's the only one who can meet that need. So if that's you, I want you to just go ahead and lift your hand up right now. Go ahead and say, God, I'm here for you. I'm ready to give my whole life to you. Go ahead and do it right now. Be bold. It's all right. We're going to pray for you. Amen. In the name of Jesus, I just pray right now. Let's all pray this prayer together for the sake of those who are ready to give their lives to Jesus. Just repeat it after me. Father God, I give my life to you. Thank you for sending your son to die on a cross 
so I could be saved and have all my sins forgiven. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me new. And I will give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we clap our hands?